Are you fascinated by God? I wonder, we can often think in our life about that widow woman, or that, uh, not the widow, but the woman with the ten pieces of silver that was engaged to get married. And she lost one of them, and she diligently sought till she found that one piece of silver. She, 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 uh, in her life, she diligently, I mean, she lit the candle, she was seeking, she was searching, she was, in her mind, she was looking for it till she found it. And I know that we often think about God looking at us that way, that He is searching and He's seeking and He's finding. But I wonder for us this morning, are we like that woman, or that woman with, the, with, the, with the nine pieces of silver and missing one, and she's looking out everywhere. She's diligently in her mind. I've got to find she lights and she searches and she looks. Are we looking for God like that this morning? Are we fascinated by God? Amen. Uh, and so I, I, that's that's where I'm drawn this morning. Are we fascinated by God? I wonder this morning if we were this morning to take a, a, a trip and we were all going to go to Niagara Falls and we get to Niagara Falls and uh, uh, we get out of Niagara Falls. I wonder if you would get out. First thing you would do is pull out a mirror and you look at yourself. Or if you look around and you would see that everyone is looking at themselves. No, they're not looking at themselves. They're looking at the majesty of Niagara Falls and how beautiful it is. How about if we got together and we all went to the Grand Canyon? And I've never seen the Grand Canyon before. I wonder, uh, maybe you've not seen it either. And we get to the Grand Canyon and we pull up in that beautiful canyon. I wonder if we would get out of the mirror and we would look at ourselves and we would be fascinated by the way that we're dressed the way that we look. Or I wonder if we'd be running to look at that gorgeous masterpiece that God has, has, has painted. This morning, I think that we're often like that. We, we stand in the magnitude of a great, wonderful God who is so magnificent, but we're too involved in looking at ourselves than looking at Him and His greatness. Are we fascinated by God? Amen. Do you know why we would look at Niagara Falls? You know why we look at the great the Grand Canyon? Because they're so great and they're so magnificent. And so this morning I want to tell you something that's bigger and greater than even those things, and that is the Creator God. Let us stand fascinated by God and who He is. I want to look at three people today that shows us the fascination of looking at God. I want to look at Peter, I want to look at Paul, and I want to start out by looking at an Old Testament character. And his name is Moses. Now remember, Moses is that guy. He's a strong leader, but you look at him, and I admire him. I love him. There's a meekness about him. There's a gentleness about him. There's just a kindness that, that as he's humbly leading, he is truly a servant leader. And in some respects, a very much a type of Christ as, as he's leading. And he writes in, in, in Psalm chapter 90, he says, oh Lord, you have blessed and you have put our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains brought forth, or, or, or ever you have formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He goes on down to say, you have turned man to destruction, and say, return ye children of men, for a thousand years in your sight uh, are but yesterday when it is past, as you are a watch in the night. And I wanted to stop right there. Here Moses is writing, and I want you to imagine, he's not writing this in Pharaoh's court, and he's not writing this as he has just crossed the Red Sea, but he is writing this in the wilderness. And he writes and he says this about God. He says, God, before the mountains, he said, before, before this earth, before the cosmos, you were. All we know is this world around us, and we look at the majesty of the earth and everything, but I want you to look past all of that, and before they were, God was. How magnificent and how fascinating we come in the trees, and, and you know what, uh, we, we, some of you may plant a tree, I planted a tree this year, and that tree, Sister Jane, may outlive me and my children will see it, maybe my grandchildren, people, I don't even have a thought, Brother David, who they are, but you know what, even before the trees were, Sister Susan, and the mountain, and this earth, and this cosmos, there were God, there was God, how fascinating is that, and the Bible says that, that God allowed man to go to his destruction. 
structure of destruction. And in the garden of Eden, he chose to sin. God allowed him to go away. This magnificent God who created the universe and always was gave man his choice. How amazing. But yet he didn't leave him to die in his choice. He said, wait a second. I want you to return. And so he made a way to the cross. How fascinating is that? Amen. If we look at uh, uh, life, and, 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 and though man chose his own path of destruction, God allowed him to follow a path of everlasting life and be to choose Jesus Christ and the work of the cross. And then I look at today, and I look back over my 40 plus years of my life. Do you know what that is like to God, Sister Jan? It's like an hour. Think about your life and your age. It's about an hour to God. You may say, wow, that's crazy. But I'm telling you, let's be drawn from ourselves to a fascinating God and allow our eyes to be fixed upon Him. How fascinating is God? And C.S. Lewis said this. He said, if you would take a piece of paper and you would spread it, you would spread it as far as your eye could see. You would spread it by the neighborhood over every corner, every nook, every cranny. You would spread that paper out there. And then, Sister Dot, you would take and you would draw three centimeters, which is about an inch. Now, grab hold of your seat and think about this. C.S. Lewis said, that is really what time looks like to God. You may say, what goes to mill? This world's been around for 6,000, not millions, 6,000 of years according to the Word of God. And you look at time and what it is, Brother Dennis, to God, it's an inch on this magnificent piece of paper that we see no beginning or end to. I want you to know this morning that God is more vast than what we ever give Him credit for being. God is vast this morning. And so we commit two sins when we stop to think about the vastness of who God is. The first sin is over here. We overestimate how well we can do things. And then on this side, we underestimate how well God can do things. Because we are so stuck in looking at ourselves and our abilities instead of standing in awe of a fascinating God and realizing who He is. You see, the sin of adultery is we look inside instead of looking out at God and realizing just how important He really is in the scheme of life. I'm talking about being fascinated by God. I read an article was interesting of uh, 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 a professor at uh, uh, North Park University, it's a Trinitarian Univers or University Bible uh, a College, and uh, uh, Scott McKnight is one of the uh, the professors there, and he asked his students dozens of questions, and this is the question that he asked them when they come into his class for the first time. He he, he says this. He says. Uh, uh, do you think Jesus ever gets nervous? Is Jesus the life of the party or is he an introvert? And then following these questions, he has to ask about two dozen more questions that are similar to them. And he says it's interesting because the results are always consistent. Because whoever is taking the test always makes Jesus to be like they are. Whether they're the life of the party, whether they're the introvert, whether they're shy, or, or however it is. He, he said this, the test results also suggest even though uh, we, 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 we like to think we are becoming more like Jesus, really the reverse happens. We try to make Jesus like us. You know what the problem is? is we are losing our fascination with who God is. Instead of us wanting to be like Him, we make Him like we are. Amen. God, help us to realize that we have been made in the image of God and we don't need to return the favor and make God in our image. Amen. We need to allow God to be God. Never underestimate God. Amen. It's serious business. In Romans chapter number 1, the Bible says... Uh, that, that uh, 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 the wrath of God is revealed against those who turn the glorious God into the image of a corruptible man. God help us because in reality, you know what we become? We become our own saviors. We think, I can do this. 
I can manage this. I can take care of this. We overestimate who we are and we underestimate uh, who He is. Can I tell you who God is? Before the world, Moses said, before the mountains, before the cosmos, was God. Amen. Our little lifespan is just a speck compared to the vastness of the eternity of who He is. Amen. God is great. Amen. When God becomes too small, we make Him paralyzed to do any good. Amen. When we think that we have God figured out, then we we think that we have the norms of God all in line. We're in trouble. About 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, probably getting introduced to be someone that got through a lot of heartache in her life. Unimaginable. Just unimaginable. I cannot imagine the heartache, the anguish she went through because of a marital relationship and a loss of a child and just, uh, and not through death, but because of marriage and had no contact with that young child. It was just a terrible, terrible story. And I can relate much more now being a dad, how agonizing it must be to have your child ripped away from you and, and not be able to see them and, and not to know of their safety and where they were. Just a terrible story. And so I, I listened to the story uh, 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 of, of this mom and, and, our, and our heart just wrenched with, 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 with pain and heartache. And, and, and in the middle of it, she said, I, I, I have become somewhat numb to God. I have become somewhat so frustrated. But I realize the thing that must keep me on track with God, that even in the midst of my heartache, and even in the midst of me feeling like I'm going insane, I realize that I must allow God to be a mystery. Because when I think I have him figured out who He is, He is no longer God. You see, we can become Christians and think that we have all the answers and we have all the control because we need to defend God and take care of God. Amen. But when we lose the mystery of who God is, we are no longer fascinated by Him and He no longer becomes God. Amen. Who's able to do anything in our life. We begin to put our eyes upon ourselves and take our eyes off of God. Where are your eyes this morning? Upon you? Or upon a God that is so amazing that you can't take your eyes off of Him. Hey Amen. I want you to know something. God is higher. Say it with me this morning. God is higher. Say it. God is higher. Amen. He's, high. He's above us. He's higher than us. He exceeds all our, our, our thoughts. Uh, His ways are not our ways. Amen. His thoughts are our thoughts. Uh, they're, they're higher. Amen. He sees things differently than we do because He's higher. I think that if we would be like Moses and see a fascinating God, that folks would see the glow of God even more in our face. Are you fascinated by God? Are you fascinated by God? Quit overestimating your own importance. And I'm not saying that you're not important, but in the scheme of things, we are one speck. He is the important one. Amen. And can you imagine that a God so magnificent would create us after His image, give us free will. He wouldn't dictate us. He wouldn't create us like robots, but He would allow us to worship Him. And even when we got off in our own way because we got our eyes off of Him and we got it upon ourselves, He would still make a way for us to come back and get our eyes back upon Him. Get your eyes upon Jesus this morning. Do you know what? There would be a lot less problems in this world if folks would get their eyes upon Jesus. There would be a lot less anxiety. There would be a lot less heartache. Amen. There would be a lot less trouble and turmoil among people if folks would just get their eyes upon Jesus. And fascinated by who He is. Amen. When we elevate Him, He is able to purify us. The psalmist said this, he said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Do you know how you get away from the dross of self? You know, all that dirty, all that dirt, all that admires is begin to magnify God. Begin to magnify a magnificent God who should be fascinating us. 
God is great. Amen. He's amazing. He's nothing short of wonderful. Amen. In Isaiah chapter number 40, God asked the question, to whom will you liken me that I, it should be my equal? He said, there's no one to the right, there's no one to the left to be my equal. God is in a class of his own. Amen. He is great. Amen. He is higher. He is wiser. Amen. His name is greater. I want you to know that God is greater than cancer. God is greater than diabetes. God is greater than anemia. God is greater than any blood clot that you can develop. God is greater than any cardiac issue, Sister Jan, any arrhythmia, any blood Amen. God is greater. God is higher. Amen. Can we be fascinated by God more than we're fascinated with modern medicine? Amen. Medicine is amazing. And there's nothing wrong with pursuing, taking care of yourself. Amen. But when you're fascinated by that more than you're fascinated by the great physician, amen, it's time to begin to get your eyes off of being parallel and level and lateral. Amen. And begin to lift them higher to a God that can fascinate you. Amen. God is able. Amen. Amen. Sometimes to look higher, we just need to have our eyes open. So let's move from Moses and let's look at a man whose name was Saul who becomes Paul on the road to Damascus. There he is. He has an eye-opening experience to a fascinating God. We think of who he is, and I don't relish the thought of how he persecuted Christians. Uh, but, but here is a man uh, that, 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 that on that day, uh, mistreating uh, uh, not only God, but the people of God. He thought he had it all together. He knew it, Brother David. Uh, he had said it. Uh, Gamaliel, sweet Sister Tina, uh, the grandson of, uh, uh, of the rabbi, Heliel, uh, the, this great scholar. And so here it was that he thought that he was so organized and he had it all together. He knew who God was and he felt like he was protecting God because here comes a man named Jesus who claims to be God. I need to protect God. This man's trying to admire who he is. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Don't worry about protecting God. He's able to take care of himself. Sometimes we think that's our job. God has not called us to protect him. So here he is. And uh, uh, feeling like he's trying to protect God. Do you ever feel like you have to rise to the defense that, that God is able and that God exists? Amen. It's time to get off of that. Amen. And you become fascinated by God. Sometimes we become, become so overwhelmed by trying to protect God and the existence of God and the nature of God and who He is that we lose the fascination with God. So uh, here it is, Paul on the road to Damascus. Amen. God arises and He falls. And He says, Who are you? Who are you? And what's the revelation? He said, I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus. Read it in Acts chapter number 9 yourself. He said, I'm Jesus. Later He refers to Him as being Lord. Amen. So there He is, that second part of the Trinity that reveals Himself to Paul. He said, I am God. Amen. I am Jesus. And the scales, it falls from His eyes. Amen. And God rises above. And the God of the Old Testament now becomes God of the New Testament. He's not a God of far off, but now He is Emmanuel, God with us. I want to tell you something this morning. We need to be fascinated by God. Not the knowledge of God. Not just reading the Word of God. Not thinking we need to defend Him. But the relationship that God is with me. Are you fascinated that the glory of God will leave heaven and come down to earth as a baby? But then He would send His Spirit, amen, to be very real to you and I this day in the New Testament church. Are you fascinated by it? We should be fascinated by God. Amen. Who He is. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Here it was that He worshipped the God of the Old Testament, but He comes to a relationship with the God of the New Testament, open to the fact that God, a Jesus, is God. Amen. Do you know what that's like? Let me show you something here on my phone. It's amazing. I can... Put my passport in there. And you may not be able to see this real well. But in this phone, there's all kinds of icons. 
I can go into uh, all kinds of things. I can go into my phone. I can go into my, my, my text messages. I can go into my, uh, uh, Facebook. I can go into my messenger on Facebook. I can go into ABC 27 News, see what the weather is. There's all kinds of things. Uh, if you want to know what the sales are at Dollar General, I have a little app on here. You can look at it, put the coupons in there if you want to. All kinds of things in there because these are icons all over here. And when I see the icon, all I need to do is press that to get to where I want to be. Can I tell you that we need to be fascinated with Jesus Christ? If you would, He is the icon of God. Amen. We need to get our eyes upon Him and know that when we press into Him, amen, we have access into the throne room of heaven because the Son of God sits on the right hand of God ever making intercession for us. Amen. Instead of being so fascinated by electronics and all the icons in the world, that gets you where you want to be. Can we put it aside and be fascinated by the Son of God, amen, who gets us into the presence of God, fascinated by Him. He is the icon. Amen. Amen. <coughs> amen. Scales dropping from our eyes so that we can see Him as He is. And then Peter says this, and I'm closing. So we look at uh, uh, Moses who shows us this God who's, who's always been and always will be and that we are nothing and that we need to oversize Him and undersize ourselves instead of underestimating and overestimating. <laughs> then we look at Paul who, to be fascinated by God, he needed the scales removed so that he could see God for who He was and have an experience with the Emmanuel. I believe that when we pray in the name of Jesus, amen, that we can expect and receive. Amen. We need to be fascinated that when we go to God in prayer, that God answers our prayer. The third individual I want to look at is Peter. He writes in 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 16. He said, For we have not followed cunningly devised faith or boast when we were made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Do you know what would really, really help us be fascinated by God if we became eyewitnesses? Do you ever hear sometimes there's, there's maybe a crime or something that happens and they say we're looking for an individual who was an eyewitness to this, who can give us more than an eyewitness. Could we get a church, amen, that are eyewitnesses to who God is and be fascinated by Him? Amen. Can you hear me this morning? It's not a fable. It's not a tale. It's not just some kind of craftiness. Sister Jan, that was divine that we spend our time with and that we hope and we wish and we rub and, and we pray and we, we hope. And Brother Dennis, but it's a reality. And God wants us to be eyewitnesses of the reality of who He is that we have died with Him, Sister Susan. We're risen in newness of life. Amen, Sister Alice, that we're a partaker of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that, that that we've seen him work and move. I remember early, and you, you all know my story, amen, when my brother first, uh, uh, so they, they were diagnosed him with all kinds of problems, and then they found out that it was his heart, he had blockages, and his ejection fraction was at 15%, very, very low, especially for a 40-year-old man, and so here it was, and then the doctor says, there's only a 25% survival rate. I remember as a young man praying and begging God and seeking God and looking for God and being there in that hospital and what God did and He survived surgery. And there in that waiting room in Cumberland, America, we were rejoicing, praising God because we were an eyewitness of a miracle of God. God worked for us. It wasn't much longer that they, they told us that everything's shutting down all those organs. It's not just his heart. It's not dialysis. Everything is shutting down. We're sending them to John Hopkins. Got them to John Hopkins. Uh, we, we just continue to pray and trust God. Spend time there until a week later the doctor sent him home. I took him to his follow-up visit with this cardiac surgeon and, and his cardiac surgeon said, I never thought I'd ever see you sitting here. You know what? I was an eyewitness to the power of God. I recently talked to a man who was going through cancer and I said, I know that God is able, don't you? Is what I said, let me tell you. I can tell you that God's able. Can I share my testimony? She said, 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer and told I had six months to live. That's 15 years ago I'm cancer free. 
an eyewitness said, I'm fascinated by God and I know what God can do. God is looking for men and women who will be eyewitnesses of the greatness of who He is, whether it's in your food pantry, or whether it's in the ICU, or whether it's in your bank account, or whether it's in your home and in, in situations. God is looking for men and women who will be eyewitnesses to the true and living God. It's amazing. One of my favorite authors I read after who shared a story, and I, I love the story. He said that even though he was in his early 40s, he said, for whatever reason, he had been diagnosed with a lacking, I think it was 12 different nutritions in his body. And so he had a team of, uh, of physicians who came together who was trying to, to, to do something to help him because he was severely anemic and depleted in these vitamins and minerals that he desperately needed in his body. And they didn't even really understand why he was depleted of them, but it was making him feel bad. You could literally see on his face that he was feeling bad. He said the very first thing, he said that the team of physicians commenced to forget and they gave him some drops and they dropped it in his mouth and, and after he had the drops, he said, how do you feel after a certain period of time? He said, I really don't feel any different. And so the doctor said, that is what we uh, had imagined. He said, but would you try this one now? Let's see what happens. And he said, immediately his eyes began to open in, uh, in such a way that he felt like life was given back to his eyes and his body. And he began to respond and feel better. And so uh, the doctor said, how do you feel with those drugs? He said, amazing. The doctor said, I know and I can tell because we can, we can diagnose how the medical Medicine is working simply by looking in your eyes. He said, I can see that you are no longer depleted because of the look in your eyes. Can I tell you that there are some that are spiritually depleted here this morning because you've overestimated yourself and you've underestimated God and the world sees and others see that you're living in depletion simply because of your eyes. Amen. But it's time for the great physician to pass by this morning and he wants to say to you, would you be amazed and fascinated by me? Would you stop overestimating yourself and what you can do? And would you stop underestimating me and allow me to be God in your life? How many of you would like to leave here with your eyes showing that you've been fascinated by God? Sister Holly, if you come this morning. Moses, Paul, Peter. Over a span of time. But each of them were eyewitnesses to the majesty of God. And their fascination with God led them to doors that only God can open for them. If you want the door to be open, I believe this, it starts with fascination with God. Do you know why Moses could lead three million people? Could you even imagine? I couldn't. Providing for the food, the shelter, the water, everything. Three, three million people. That's say three thousand, it's three million. You know how he did it? Because he wasn't looking at himself. And he wasn't underestimating God. But he was trusting God. Who was here before the mountains and the trees and this earth and this cosmos? God will lead us. I'm fascinated by Him. It's shown in the face of Moses, and He led the children of Israel. Then we have Saul, Paul, who became so influential in the New Testament, and we still read his epistles and letters to churches because. The scales were dropped. He didn't feel like he had to defend God. But Emmanuel was with him. And so he shared God and was fascinated by God. Stop just feeling like you need to defend God in your life and live your life fascinated by God because it becomes the greatest apologetic that any of us could use. Because it's evident in our face that God is God. And then we have Peter. He says it's not a fairy tale. 
Sister Jan, yesterday I just came to a whole new world. And this morning, Brenda reminded me of it. My Goldilocks was different back in my day and age, Brother Wally. But Brenda's Goldilocks, Sister Tina, is a new book. I'm sure you're going to appreciate this. Goldilocks Goes Potty. An old fable with a new twist. This is an old fable that we're trying to give a new twist to. This is God that when we become an eyewitness of Him, our fascination will be shown to everybody because we won't be depleted anymore, but it will show in our eyes. So I'm simply saying this to us, church. Could we have a fresh new fascination of God? Don't stand upon a, a, a Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon and look at yourself, but look at the magnificence of the self of the all. Could you this morning come to the altar without just looking at you and your stuff, amen, thinking how you're going to do it, amen, while you overestimate yourself and underestimate God? But would you come and say, God, I'm coming to be an eyewitness because you're fascinating. If I have a church who's challenged by that this morning, would you come and be fascinated by a fascinating God? Let's come around this morning, if you would. Come.